Well, good morning, church. It is a privilege for me to stand before you this morning, and uh, one of the things that I often get asked when I have the opportunity to preach, are you going to preach on missions? You better believe it. (laughs) I would say that unless we are preaching regularly about missions, we have lost the plot as a church. We need to hear missions regularly from the pulpit. And if we don't, we are living to fill ourselves and there's no outlet for our salvation. This morning I want us to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 to 10, but I want to focus on just verses 8 to 10 and in particular, verse number 10. But as you turn there, I want to tell you about Hudson Taylor, who was a missionary to China. Hudson Taylor went to China as a missionary and served the Lord there for decades. And this is one thing that he wrote. I'm so grateful for Uh, stories about missionaries, their biographies and autobiographies. And this is what Hudson Taylor says. The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. It's not an option to be considered. It's a command to be obeyed. I want to ask you a few questions with regards to this Quote, what if you get to the end of your life and you discover that you missed the purpose for living life? All that you worked for, invested in, focused on is just worthless. Are you living for what is eternal? Are you walking in what God has prepared for you to do in this life? How are you living your life in response to God's amazing grace. How are you living your life in response to God's amazing grace? You see, the Great Commission is a command to be carried out by every believer individually, but also corporately as a church. It's all our responsibility. It's not the responsibility of a select few who we perhaps would call missionaries or fanatics. The Great Commission is for every single believer, every person who belongs to the church. The Great Commission is for you, and you need to be involved in some way. You may ask me, well, what is the Great Commission? I don't really know. I've heard it being spoken about, but what is the Great Commission? Well, that's something we're going to look at carefully this morning, and we're going to look at some Great Commission passages this morning. But just quickly to tell you, the Great Commission is the last command that Jesus gave to his disciples before he returned to heaven. We always talk about a person's last words and that what they've said should be something significant. Well, I would say... Jesus said something very significant. He didn't just die and stay dead. He was raised from the dead and then ascended back to heaven. So this risen Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, gave a great commandment for us to obey. It's not just to be considered, it is to be obeyed. The last, or I should say so, obedience... To the Great Commission must be the appropriate response to God's amazing grace of salvation in our lives. Obedience should be our response. That's an appropriate response to God's amazing grace of salvation. How do we respond to God's amazing grace of salvation? Well, I want us to look at these verses this morning, and in particular, we are going to... Um, hear a, a, a fair amount about this amazing grace. This amazing grace. Let us read there from verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2. 
And it says, and you, that's you and me, all of us sitting here, you, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Father, as we come to your word this morning, I pray that you will help us to understand what you want us to see in this text this morning, to see that the Great Commission is so great because you are a great God. May we see that this morning from this text. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ephesians balances doctrine, or we can say theology, and then practice. Um, how do we conduct ourselves now that we are Christians? There's a balance. And we can see that in the letters that Paul writes, he's often, he, he, he starts off on a theological note. He wants to lay a foundation for how we ought to live our life. And we see the same thing applies here. Paul writes to this church at Ephesus and is a reminder to us what God has done for us, but then he also tells us what we must do for him in response to his mercies. Christian living is based on Christian learning. Christian living is based on Christian learning. What you are learning must be able to help you to live the Christian life. You see, naturally, we do sinful things. That's our natural inclination. So when we look at even Ephesians, we can see that um, Paul wants us to understand and learn what it means to be a child of God, but then for us to be able to apply it and live the Christian life. You see, the believer who does not know their wealth in Christ will never be able to walk for Christ. Walk, walking in Christ. Our conduct depends on our calling to Jesus Christ for salvation. Too many Christians live in chapters 1, 2, and 3. They study the doctrines very carefully. They want to make sure they, they, they've got their theological T's crossed and I's dotted, as it were. But then they fail to move on to chapters 4 to 6 that speaks about um, practices, um, how we should live as a Christian, wa walking in the good works that God has prepared for us to do in this life. This life is the only life we've got to live here on this earth. And so how are we living it? Are we living it in light of what chapters 1, 2, 3 teach us? We will also remember that in Revelation 2, Jesus has a bone to pick with this church at Ephesus. And he says, this is what I have against you. A church that is strong on doctrine, on truth, recognizes false teachers and false uh, teaching.'" 
But he says, this I have against you. You have departed from your first love. You have departed from your first love. How can we as Christians depart from our first love that is demonstrated in Christ's grace and mercy when he sent Jesus to die for our sin? How can we lose that first love? It is easy when we are focusing on things that, um, are, or if I can say we are lopsided in our focus, when we don't learn to put into practice what we learn, we, don't, we must put into practice the things that we learn. You see, the Christian life is meant to be lived according to God's works that He has prepared for us to do. Chapters 4 to 6 spell that out for us. So we could summarize the whole book of Ephesians just like this. Chapter 1 speaks about our possessions in Christ. The riches that we have in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 speaks about our position in Christ. Individually, but also corporately. Goes on into chapter 3 to speak about um, how the church is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. All are included in God's salvation. And when we come to salvation, we are one in Christ in the church. Chapter 3 also, um, we, we um, see a prayer of enablement to be able to live for, for Christ. And then 4 to 6, as I've said, speaks about our conduct, our walk, our behavior. Have you ever thought about the spiritual life? When we come to salvation, God saves us. What is the ultimate goal of the spiritual life. What is the goal of the spiritual life? It's maturity. It's maturity. It's to see that we are um, one with Christ. It, we must see how our conduct, our character, and our conversation changes. When we mature in our character, our conduct, and our conversation we are maturing. It's called sanctification. We are being made holy. We are becoming more Christ-like. Now that should not be the end. Why are we maturing? We are maturing so that we can be useful workers for God. And I want us to see that this morning. So here in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, as we have read speaks about what we were. We were dead in our transgressions of what we were. And then chapters 4 to 9 speaks about what God did. What God did. And chapters 8 and chapter 10 says, speaks about what we are now. What we are now. But verse 4 is like, you can say, the rest of this passage hangs on two words that come out of verse 4. Let's read verse 4 again. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up with Him, and seated with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you see those first two words? But God... But God, and these are two words that make all the difference in life. If it isn't for but God, we are lost. We have no hope. We have no hope. So after reading the terrible wickedness of people, of mankind in verses 1 to 3, these first two words of verse 4 make this emphatic declaration, but God, but God. God stepped into our world of sinfulness when Jesus came to this earth. He came here for the very specific purpose for dying on the cross for mankind's sin. Jesus didn't come here for any other reason but for that. 
And that's why we can say, but God. If it isn't for but God, we have no purpose for living life. It is but God that makes the difference and should make the difference in each of our lives. So, verses 4 to 10 are a description of the glorious salvation that we have in Christ. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Don't we preach that from this pulpit often? Yes, we do. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Sometimes... Unfortunately, we overlook this little word, but. And in this passage, it speaks about the greatest contrast of all creation. The greatest contrast in all creation. We could say in a sense that these words contain the entire gospel message. You may say, oh, how so? How, how can those two words contain the, uh, uh, the whole gospel message? Well, they show the ultimate contrast. What is that contrast? They show man's predicament, but it also so shows God's provision. What's man's predicament? He's lost. He's dead in his trespasses and sin. God's provision, what is God's provision? Jesus who came to this world to pay the penalty for sin so that we can be made right with God. The contrast is, man's, is between man's helplessness, but it declares God's hope. God's hope. So this speaks of salvation from God. Uh, and uh, Salvation from God's wrath in Christ alone. Is this not the good news? Is this not the good news? The good news of Jesus Christ? Must this gospel message not be proclaimed to all mankind? This is the great commission that must be obeyed. To proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That in him there is salvation. There is salvation in no other name in heaven and on earth except the name of Jesus Christ. This is what must be proclaimed. By whom? All of us, all believers are given that responsibility. So verses 1 to 10 of Ephesians 2 is God's amazing gospel work of grace for us, in us, but also through us. So this morning, I want us to see three amazing reasons that make the Great Commission great. I want us to see three amazing reasons from our passage that makes the Great Commission great. And that's why you will hear about this, our responsibility in missions regularly from this pulpit. I know that our pastor, Joseph, loves missions. We've been on the mission field often. I know his heart, so I know that you will hear this regularly from him. But you will also hear it regularly from others who preach from this pulpit, because it is so important. It's not an addendum. It's, a, not, it's not a line item on our budget missions. It may be there, but let me say, missions, if it's just a line item, an addendum, we miss the point. You miss the point of your salvation. We miss the point of us being edified together as a church. Ultimately, our responsibility is to see the Great Commission is great because of God's grace. So three amazing reasons that make the Great Commission great. Verses 8 to 9. Verses 8 to 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. Can you see? It says very clearly, For by grace you have been saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. I, don't, I sometimes think we miss the richness of that word grace. 
as a youngster, I was taught, how do you remember what does grace mean? Well, in English, we can use it like this. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. But I want you to see verses 4, from verse 4 to 7. What does it say? But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And... He didn't only make us alive, and He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Did you notice, take note of grace and mercy in these few verses of our passage? God's love is expressed to us human beings in these two words, grace and mercy. How does God relate His love to us? Through grace and mercy. So if grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, what does that mean? It means I get something I don't deserve. That's grace. Some people think that they are lovable enough for God just to say, oh, I love you so much, I will give you salvation. Salvation came at a cost. It came at a cost, the blood of Jesus Christ. It had, sin had to be paid for. Jesus paid that price. And so grace is God giving us eternal life, something we do not deserve. That's what grace is. Then what is mercy? Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. What do we deserve as sinners? We deserve God's wrath, God's judgment because of our sin. We deserve hell, death. That's what we deserve. And so mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting something that we don't deserve. Eternal life in heaven. So God's love is expressed to us as human beings in His grace and His mercy. Romans 5, verses 6 to 8, if you want to go there, you may or just listen. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for the righteous man, for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's amazing grace, isn't it? That's amazing grace. What about 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 to 17? When Paul writes to young Timothy, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason, he says, I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost Christ Jesus might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Grace and mercy is seen in even other parts of the Bible over and over again. Isn't that amazing grace? 
One more. 1 Peter 1. And I just want to read verses 18 and 19 where it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. That's amazing grace, isn't it? That's amazing grace. That's why when he says here in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That is just it. We have been saved by grace through faith. Those that have come to the knowledge of their sin before our holy God, the one who repents of their sin, turns away from their sin and puts their faith in Christ alone, God graciously forgives them their sin. How does that work? Well, because God sees our heart. Many people will say things with their lips, but their life does not demonstrate a saved life. You see, Jesus' blood was shed for our redemption. We're going to celebrate this next weekend. The passion of Christ. When he went to the cross for us, his blood was shed there. I am so grateful for my upbringing. I'm grateful that God gave me parents that loved him. And God gave me parents that not only loved the Lord, but showed it. They taught me from the time I was born about the Bible. About Jesus. About the need that I have of a Savior. I'm grateful that I went to a church and Sunday school that taught the Bible faithfully. I'm grateful to the Lord that at a young age, I, in a simple way, put my trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm grateful for that. Many people do not have that privilege of growing up in a Christian home. They only hear via somehow that there is salvation in Christ. They've never seen it. I'm grateful that I saw that in our home. I, we saw that in our church. And I have seen it in other believers over and over again. Isn't that God's amazing grace? You have a testimony of salvation too. That's God's amazing grace. You know when somebody is saved. How do you know it? Their life changes. Their life changes. You see, we learn that we need to become more like Christ. That our conduct, our character, and our conversation needs to reflect this grace that comes from Jesus Christ. The emphasis here in verse 9 says, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Not as a result of works that no one may boast. We need to emphasize that because it is not our works, any good works that can save us. It's impossible. There's no good works that is good enough for God to receive you. So what's so great about the Great Commission? God's amazing grace. What's amazing about uh, uh, God's grace is that He has saved me. He's given me new life. We should sing, uh, when we sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, we should have a renewed understanding of our salvation every time we sing. We even sang songs this morning that reflect God's amazing grace. The second amazing reason that makes the Great Commission great is found in verse 10. God's amazing plan. God's amazing plan. What does verse 10 say? It says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Mm. This verse this word for in this verse 
tells us why salvation is not from man or by man's works. The reason is that salvation is God's workmanship. We are His creation, a new creation. That word workmanship, used only here and also in Romans 1.20, means a work of art, a masterpiece. A work of art, a masterpiece. It differs from the human works that are mentioned in verse 9. It's a different word. You see, believers are God's workmanship because they have been created a work only God can do in Christ have you ever thought about that what this word means salvation is God's masterpiece you being saved are God's masterpiece you think about that if I am God's masterpiece God's masterwork it must be amazing, isn't it? You see, God's amazing plan from the, before the foundations of the world was that He was going to send His Son to save man from his sin. Why? Because God knew what man would do. And God also knew what He would do. From eternity past, God planned for Jesus to die on the cross for our sin. Don't you think that's an amazing plan? It sure is an amazing plan. And, and it's, what's even more amazing is that for me, a sinner, like Paul says, I'm the foremost of sin, sinners, am God's master, uh, uh, master plan or masterpiece, I should say. The purpose of this creation is that believers would do good works. God's workmanship is not achieved by good works, but it is to result in good works. Something we should always remember is that we can never work for our salvation. Our good works would never buy our salvation. The same thing applies after salvation. Your good works are not going to buy you favor with God. Your good works cannot buy you favor with God. It cannot save you any more or any better because it's done deal. Jesus said it is finished. Jesus accomplished the work to save us from our sin. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Well, you you will continue after your salvation, for by grace you have been saved through faith. The just shall live by faith alone. That's how we live. But we need to understand something about these good works. It's good works that God has prepared for us to do. God has prepared good works for us to do, to walk in them. As I've mentioned, chapters 4 to 6 speak about these good works. We must walk in these things. Titus 2 verse 14 says, He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. It's not our good works, it's good works that God has prepared for us to do. Go and do a good reading of the rest of Ephesians, especially 4 to 6. Also in Titus 3 to 8, this saying is trustworthy. I want, you to, uh, I want to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. After all, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So those who have repented of their sin and trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation are his masterpiece. A trophy of God's grace. God's plan from eternity past, as I've said, was to bring salvation to all human beings. 
That is an amazing plan. That is an amazing plan. So what's so great about the Great Commission is God's amazing plan. God's amazing plan. He saved us and He wants to use us to live out His purposes in our lifetime. Are you living out God's purposes where he has put you, the job he has given you, the place that he has put you, the family that he has given you? Are you living out his purposes? Are you living out his good works that has been prepared for you? Well, I want us then to look at the third amazing reason that makes the Great Commission great. What's the third reason that makes the Great Commission great? Well, also from verse 10, our amazing opportunity, our amazing opportunity, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, so that we will walk in them. Opportunity. God has given us opportunity to live out His purposes, to live out, to walk in His good works that He's prepared for us. Chapters 4 to 6 speak about taking off the old man, putting on the new man, that our speech, our conduct should be of such nature that people can see we're different, that we're not of the world. Goes on to speak about um, how we conduct ourselves in our relationships with people. Children with their parents, fathers in, their, in the home, mothers in the home, employees to employers, employers to employees. Our conduct must be seen of such a nature that as we live life, we are walking in the good works that God has prepared for us beforehand. That's why we need to see a changed life when somebody says, I am a Christian, I'm born again. If there's not a changed life, there cannot be salvation there. It cannot be. Our opportunity. What is our amazing opportunity that we have? Well, the purpose of these prepared in advance works is that we will walk in them. We must walk in them. In other words, God has prepared a path of good works for believers which He will perform in and through us as we walk by faith. It's God performing His work in and through us, believers. Philippians 2, in verses 12 and 13, I, I believe, make this abundantly clear of what God is doing through us. It says there in verse 12, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say that we must figure out how I want to be saved. No, that's a done deal. Now that you are saved, work out your salvation. Work out your saved life with fear and trembling. How are you going to conduct yourself? What is your character going to resemble? What is your conversation going to say about um, the fact that you say that you're saved? Are you more Christ-like? Are you growing in Christ-likeness? What are the good works that are you doing? Are the good works you are doing your own good works? Or God's good works that is prepared beforehand? We must be living out God's purpose. God's purpose for us. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's not a, it's not a thing to be taken lightly. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to His good purpose. God is at work in us as believers so that we will be living out His purpose. 
Haven't you found that God sometimes thwarts your ideas of what you want to do? He stops you in your tracks, throws a curveball, as we would say, is to get our attention very often because it's so easy for us to be distracted from God's purposes. If we want to live out God's purposes, shouldn't we be discovering what that is? We can only discover what God's purposes is from His Word. And Ephesians is a great letter that was written to the church at Ephesus that explains how we ought to live our life. What is God's purpose? What is God's will for me in my life? Life, Well, it's for me to become more Christ-like. How do I do that? Well, it is living in obedience to these good works that He has prepared for those that He has saved. So verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2, I just want to give a bit of an overview here before I carry on. It demonstrates that though people were spiritually dead and deserving only God's wrath, in His marvelous and amazing grace, He has provided salvation through faith. Believers are God's workmanship in whom and through whom He performs good works. So God's wants to perform His good works through you. Through you. You're not just saved for your own goodness sake. Oh, I've, I've, I've escaped hell. That's all that matters. I've escaped hell. No. God is interested in making you more Christ-like and for you to live out His purposes in your life. You see, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, before He sent it back to heaven, He tells His disciples about His plan to use them for His purposes. And Jesus had met with a number of people between His resurrection, just before He ascended back into heaven. But one thing that stands out so clearly as he speaks with people on different occasions, is this, his great command to go and to preach Jesus Christ, the good news, to all nations. I want us to look at the five passages of the New Testament that speaks about the Great Commission and our responsibility to work, walk in it, work in it, what God has given to us. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. This is often quoted as the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18, 16 to 20. Even or the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came near to them and he said, and I want you to take note of these words again. Look at all the words, all, all, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He, he, Jesus has got the authority to say what he's saying. All authority is mine, he says. Go, therefore, go, go. go. You hear that command, go? What does go mean? It means go. <laughs> <laughs> when you say calling someone to come to you, it's in a command, come. Now Jesus is saying, go. We must go. Where must we go? What must we go and do? Well, Jesus said, go and make disciples. Yes, he has a key word, make disciples. What are we doing in this church? As we gather, every time we gather together, we are making disciples. We're not just gathered here for the sake of being here together. Us, ah, good teas, coffees waiting for us, some biscuits and rusks maybe. No. Yeah, we are making disciples. We don't have just have a program for the youth, a program for the junior youth, a program on a Wednesday where we go to our programmed Bible studies. Oh, well, they are programs for a purpose, to make disciples. So if we've been making disciples, yeah, what are we doing that for? 
so that you will go make disciples somewhere else. You'll go. Okay? So go. Make disciples, where does it say? Of all nations. Now, I know we've got a fair representation of nations here. But it doesn't mean that we are not to go somewhere else. We are to go and make disciples of all nations. Where's all nations? It's the rest of the world. Before we change this stage here, we had a, a massive map of the world on the wall right over here. I think we need another massive map of the world in front of us so that we can be reminded that we are to make disciples of all nations. And you can only do that when you go. You can't do that sitting here in the pew or in your classroom when you have Bible study. You are going when you go to work. That's where you also should be making disciples, yes. But we also should be purposeful in sending out people from this church as missionaries to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything. Observe what? All, everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always. Always to the end of the age. Mark 16, then he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You see, even the gospel of Marcus makes it very clear of the great commission. I'm going to jump to John 20, 21, where Jesus said to them, peace to you as the Father has sent me I am sending you. I'm sending you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And then Luke and Acts. I'm putting these two together because Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And it says there in verse 20, uh, chapter 24, verse 46 and 47, He, Jesus, also said to them, This is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on, uh, on the uh, rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of so sins would be proclaimed. Proclaimed, it would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You see, this is what He says. This is what is written. This is what is written. So in other words, it is a work that God has prepared beforehand for us to do. To proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And then Acts 1.8, just before Jesus goes back to heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Doesn't that tell you something about the where? It's the world. Jerusalem needed to be reached for the gospel. Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. By God's grace, the gospel came to Africa. Amen. By God's grace, we have heard this good news. And by God's grace, we need to take this good news back to those countries that brought the gospel here. Because many of those countries are godless today. Great Britain is no more great anymore. Great Britain is in a pit of disaster. Just like America is going to. That's where the gospel was proclaimed from by thousands and thousands of missionaries over the years. We need to go back and remind them what their forefathers brought to us. And you know what? That is happening today. The third world is sending out more missionaries than the first world. Did you know that? You may not have known that. But the third world is sending out more missionaries today than the first world. That tells you, when you take God's grace for granted, you're in trouble. You are headed for disaster. These Great Commission passages tell us about our opportunity. Our opportunity for world evangelization. Here we are speaking about missions. 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 
Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in Him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Not we are the righteousness, we might become the righteousness of God. So what's an appropriate response to God's amazing grace that we have received? Well, it is wholeheartedly to obey the Great Commission. Wholeheartedly to obey. You may say to me, well, I'm not too sure what you're talking about. God's amazing plan to save us from our sins gives rise to our amazing opportunity to, to be part of what God is doing. Coming to the end of teaching church history to our students in Zimbabwe, there's this statement that is made in our textbook. I love it. I love this statement. When missions cease to be the focus of the church, the church fails in its God-given mission. When missions cease to be the focus of the church, the church fails in its God-given mission. That is seen throughout church history. When the church focused on itself and its selfish desires, the church failed. The church exists to take this good news of Jesus to a lost world. It's each one of our responsibility. So walking in good works is just this, to show on earth who the glorified Christ is in heaven. That's the good works. To show on earth who the glorified Christ is in heaven. How are people going to know who Christ is unless we tell them? And it's each believer's responsibility to do just that. Even Jesus, when he was here on this earth and he looked at his own people, Israel, he sees they are like sheep without a shepherd. And he has compassion on them. And what does it say in Matthew 9? It says that the laborers are few. And that we must pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And also in Luke 10 verse 2. As Jesus sends out the 70. He says the harvest is plentiful. Ready for the harvest. But the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his field. Are you praying for God's work to be taken by workers into this world? Who are you praying for, for the Lord to send to the mission field? Who are you praying for? Are you praying for anyone for God to send to the mission field? Are you perhaps praying for God to send your children? Are you perhaps pray, praying for God to send your grandchildren? Or are you perhaps praying that God will send you? We should be praying these things, not afraid of these things. In Matthew chapter 6, it speaks about us not worrying about what we will eat, what we will put on. Because our Father in heaven will take care of us. And God has proved himself over and over how he cares for his own. Listen to this, another great quote from Hudson Taylor. Let us give up our work, our thoughts, our plans, ourselves, our lives, our loved ones, our influence, our all, right into his hand. And then when we have given all over to him, there will be nothing left for us to trouble our, about or to make trouble about. <laughs> I love it. Because if we give everything over to the Lord, which is His anyway, we don't have to worry about these things. He's the one that will direct us, and He's the one that will provide. I brought a great book here this morning. This is an autobiography by John Payton. John Payton. John Payton was a Scottish a Scotsman, who grew up in a home whose father prayed openly every day when they had family worship. 
He prayed for the heathen. Back in those days, they spoke about the unsaved as heathen. Okay, so I'm going to use that terminology this morning, not in a derogatory way, but to understand how terms were used back then. The heathen, the unsaved. He prayed. This father wanted to go. But God didn't allow this man, this father, to go to the mission field. But you know what he did? He trained up his children well, taught them well, that his own children had a desire to go to the mission field. And when John Payton was ready to be sent to the New Hebrides, today it's called Vanuatu, the islands of Vanuatu, of the South Pacific, Many people did not want to go there or want him to go. They said that if you go there, you're probably going to die. Why? Because they were known for cannibalism. Just before John Payton went there, two missionaries ended up in the pot. And so this news gets out to the world. And there's fear in the hearts of people to go. John Payton to check his own heart. He said, I, is this desire just my desire? Or is this something that God has put on my heart to go? He even spoke to his parents. And this is what his father said to him. When you were born, we laid you on the altar and asked that the Lord will use you for his purposes. We will send you with our blessing no matter what happens. Why? Because I know, we know, uh, you are in God's hands. One of the church folk, an older man, was dead against John Payton being sent to him as a missionary. And eventually John Payton had to respond. And this is what he says. Amongst the many who sought to deter me was one dear old Christian gentleman whose crowning argument always was, the cannibals, you will be eaten by cannibals. At last I replied, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in that great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. Man, I tell you, that hits home to me because I, am I willing to do that? To go to places, war-torn places of this world, places where people are so dead against Christ, they will kill you for just saying that you're a Christian. Are we praying the kind of prayer that our children will go, that our grandchildren will go? Are we willing to walk in the good works that God has prepared for us. Without, here's another quote from Hudson Taylor, without an element of risk in our exploits for God, there is no need for faith. If we can do it ourselves, why do we need God? But this is God's work. So in closing, I want to remind you that we have explored three amazing reasons that make the Great Commission great. God's amazing grace that is evident in saving you. God's amazing plan to make you His masterpiece. And our amazing opportunity for us to walk in the good works that God has prepared for us to do, namely proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world. So, obedience to the Great Commission must be the appropriate response to God's amazing grace of salvation in our lives. The question is, what are you doing? What are you willing to do? Are you using your God-given opportunity 
or are you wasting your opportunity to be part of the Great Commission? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that is so powerful. Thank you that we have the privilege of serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in reaching a lost world for, for your sake, for your honor, for your glory. I just think of the words in Ephesians 3 that Paul prays, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, be beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.